sponsored by the Department of Material Science and Engineering, as well as the Women in Material Science Group of Penn State. We have two sessions on March 23rd, as well as on March 30th. This is the March 23rd session. And so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Helen McGall was a British crystallographer whose career started near World War II. And um, she has some ties to Penn State that I'll discuss as, as we go on. Uh, but I wanted to begin by just pointing out that she was one of these seminal people in the history of ferroelectricity. And when my advisor, Professor Robert Newnham retired, I found in his filing cabinets, a series of handwritten notes from Helen McGaw. It was about 14 pages in her beautiful script uh, about her early work on ferroelectricity. Um, and uh, this is partially published in a book that's largely available in Japanese. So I was really lucky to, to, to be able to find it. Uh, but could you could go forward a slide, please. So Professor McGaw um, earned her PhD in crystallography in, um, in the early 1940s. Immediately following her PhD, she was not employable. Um, and she ended up spending four years after her postdoc uh, as a school teacher for children that had been evacuated from London to the north of Britain when um, London was being very heavily bombed um, by the Germans during early World War II. So she um, spent four years as a school teacher. In April 1943, uh, the Scientific Central Register, which was the UK organization which was trying to organize scientists during World War II, posted a search for an X-ray crystallographer. And she applied and was ultimately selected for that position. She went to Mitchum Works, uh, which was formerly part of Philips. Um, however, when um, the when Holland was overrun by Nazi Germany, uh, they obviously couldn't have a research arm for um, the Germans operating in the UK. And so the British government took it over and renamed it Mitchum Works. And so McGall went to work um, at Mitchum Works uh, Limited. And her job, mind you, was to be an x-ray crystallographer. Alas, they had no x-ray tube for her. And so she had to actually start by building her own x-ray tube. And in the summer of 1944, um, uh, Dr. Rushman told her that there were some capacitors, a very high capacitance that had been sent from America. She was not on the official allowed allocation list to receive one of those, but she somehow obtained some. We don't entirely know how, how. We think it was from Willis Jackson. She pulled them apart and she started the first structure determination on barium titanate uh, that was of, of really high quality. She ended up solving the base, basic crystal structure of the tetragonal and the cubic forms of barium titanate, but was not allowed to publish these due to the Official Secrets Act. If you could go to the next slide. Um, ultimately, either pressure from McGaw or pressure from Bragg, as in the Bragg of Bragg's Law Bragg, um, allowed publication of her structure determination for barium titanate in nature in, um, that should have been 1945, not 2945. Um, and she described the tetragonal and cubic polymorphs. Her paper was published back to back with a paper by Rooksby, um, who had um, done a less elegant refinement of the crystal structure. In this case, the editor of Nature um, happens to know that Rooksby's work had also been done, hadn't been allowed to be published. And so when McGaw's paper was finally released, um, the editor contacted Rooksby and published the two back to back so both sets of authors could get credit. The figure on the right hand side shows Helen McGaw um, to, uh, later on in her career uh, with a picture of the perovskite crystal structure behind her. She was known for being able to draw any crystal structure from any orientation by hand. And so that is one of her hand drawings of the perovskite crystal structure. Next slide, please. 
She then went on and made major, major contributions to the field of ferroelectricity. She looked at barium strontium titanate crystal structures. She ultimately did the first structure refinements of many of the sodium niobates. Um, so if you could go to the next slide. Ultimately, she took this work and published the first textbook on ferroelectricity and crystals. And she pointed out many things that we are still working to understand now. She pointed out that there was a very close relationship between spontaneous and fiberelectricity. She pointed out the structure requirements that make that ferroelectric polarization be reversible. And I would note that um, my thesis advisor, Professor Robert Noonan, who's a very famous professor at Penn State, um, who ultimately became very well known for his work on ferroelectricity, got his introduction to ferroelectricity when he went to Cambridge, where he was working with Pro Professor McGaw, was his advisor at Cambridge. Uh, and she plopped the draft of this textbook down on his desk and told him that it was his job to proofread it. And so that was one of the, that was the first introduction of Professor Noonan uh, to the field of, of ferroelectricity. Next slide. Professor McGaw went on to a very long and illustrious scientific career, uh, determining crystal structures of many different things. She was really well known for her work on ice. And they actually named an island in the Antarctic for her based on her contributions to the understanding of ice. Um, because she was so seminal to the understanding of perovskites and perovskite crystal structure, the calcium stanite um, perovskite is, is known as Magoid. It was a, named in her honor. Um, she was the first woman to receive the Roebling Medal of the Mineralogical Society of North America. And she ultimately received two honorary doctorates. Um, another famous Penn State luminary, uh, Professor Eric Cross, uh, report, repeatedly claimed that he had distorted Professor McGaw's entire life by inducing her to study the many, many crystal polymorphs of sodium niobate, which she ultimately spent decades doing. Um, she wrote elegant uh, notes on all of the professional lectures that she delivered, and those are available at Girton College and Cambridge. Professor McGaw did spend uh, at least a couple of months at Penn State, uh, working in the uh, very uh, large crystallography group that Ray Papinski had established here. Um, and um, I, my father-in-law, who was a grad student at the time, remembers being asked to go out um, to, 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 to take her to one of the local lakes. Um, in October to go swimming, which he remembers as being totally freezing, but apparently she had quite a lovely time. So that's my introduction to Professor McGaw. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that was Susan Triller McKinstry. Next up, we have uh, John Morrow. Great, thank you, Enrique, and thank you, Susan. Um, so I'd like to introduce here our own department chair, Dr. Susan Sinnott. Uh, so she earned her bachelor's degree in chemistry from University of Texas at Austin and then went on for her PhD in physical chemistry from Iowa State. Uh, after a postdoc at Naval Research Lab, she went on to become an assistant professor at University of Kentucky, followed by associate and full prof at University of Florida. And uh, then we're very fortunate that she came to Penn State to become our department head. Uh, so she's a very distinguished scientist, a fellow of numerous organizations, as well as editor in chief of one of the, the leading um, materials computation related journals, Computational Material Science published by Elsevier. Um, she's probably most well known in the community as being the inventor of new reactive force fields, um, such as Rebo, which is the reactive empirical bond order and comb the charge optimized many body potentials. And uh, these are really special because it, it finds the middle ground between uh, traditional classical molecular dynamics uh, and the, the much more computationally intensive density functional theory. So it adds the ability to, to capture a lot more accurate details um, without all of the additional costs that would be associated with quantum level simulations. 
of course, beyond this, we, we all know her as our uh, department head. And uh, as somebody now who's, I guess I've been working in the field for close to 20 years, yeah, 20 years now. Um, I've had, I think, eight different bosses during that time. And I can say from experience that it is a, a very rare thing to find a, a truly great one. And I feel very fortunate to have that here at Penn State. Um, and as somebody who uh, has great leadership skills as well as management skills, because it, it takes both uh, to be successful in this role. And also who knows um, that uh, it's the people that come first and someone who always puts other people ahead of herself. Um, so I, I feel very fortunate uh, for that. Thank you, Susan. And Enrique, if you can move on to the next slide. I'd also like to highlight my dear friend, Dr. Jane Cook. Uh, so she is originally from Los Angeles and uh, then got her Bachelor of Science degree from New Mexico Tech, went on to the Badger State to get her MS and PhD in Metallurgical Engineering, uh, postdoc at Naval Research Lab, a uh, popular place for postdocs. Uh, followed by uh, becoming an engineer at the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Um, from there, she had a, a career, I think 15 or 16 year career at Corning Incorporated, um, becoming a senior research associate there. Um, that's where we met and uh, worked closely together on a couple of different projects, as well as a lot of um, informal interactions. Uh, from there, she pursued her love of, of art and education and science uh, by becoming the chief scientist at the Corning Museum of Glass for several years. And it's, it's there she got to, to really um, serve as the, this um, bridge connecting the various communities, the, the art community with the science and engineering community and uh, being an educator for the tens of thousands of people who come in every year to, to visit uh, the Corning Museum of Glass, you know, all of whom are there be, uh, because they at least have some interest in glass and therefore in materials science or uh, materials art. Um, so from Corning Museum of Glass, then she came here to Penn State to become the uh, director of our uh, College of EMS Museum and Art Gallery. Uh, she's doing an amazing job with that and is currently um, leading the way and um, reconfiguring the uh, basically the entire museum during uh, this COVID time. So um, it's going to be uh, moved. So it's all on, on one side of the hallway and Dyke building. More on that later. Uh, but she's also a research professor in MATC and uh, is very involved with a lot of the glass related research that we're doing here. Uh, and also with the instruction for our 415 class, Introduction, introduction to Glass Science and uh, Materials Kinetics, the 503 class, as well as being the designer of the cover for the textbook. Um, so she's got a, a very uh, impressive career that, that spans across many diverse fields. Uh, she's a world leader in STEAM education and outreach. Um, and one of those very, very few people who can be so successful uh, in all of those areas and being a bridge among all those areas and trying to build the understanding that, you know, we're all, um, you know, coming from these different backgrounds and studying these same materials, but doing so from very different perspectives. And, you know, if we just take the time to, to listen to one another and, and learn from each other, then we can build a, a much more comprehensive and fulfilling understanding of, of materials and all the beautiful things and useful things that we can do with them. So thank you. Thank you, John. Next up, we have uh, Nitin Samar. Um, so uh, so I, I decided to select um, um, a colleague of mine who works in quantum computing and she's, um, just to give the students a sense of um, how someone can start off as a scientist in a fairly mainstream area and then go out after blue sky research and with sheer persistence, make things happen. So uh, this is Michelle Simmons. She's um, a professor. She's the Cientia Professor of Physics at the University of New South Wales, way down under. Um, she did her PhD at the University of Durham in the UK. Um, and her PhD was on solar cells, so two six materials like cadmium telluride grown by 
um, metal organic vapor phase epitaxy. Um, you know, very nice mainstream thorough work on, on an area that was fairly mature. Um, and then she went on to uh, join Mike Pepper's group at um, the University of Cambridge, also in the UK. And there she made a transition and started working on um, um, two-dimensional electron gases. So she moved from MOVPE to molecular beam epitaxy or MBE. Um, so continuing sort of semiconductor epitaxial work, but going much more into the sort of fundamental physics. So studying things like the quantum Hall effect, she did some really um, fascinating experiments at low temperatures um, with, um, um, with 2D electron gases and did some um, really outstanding and influential work there, very highly cited work. Um, and then as I'll show you in the next few slides, um, she moved on from there to Australia. Um, and this is where she really has made an enormous scientific impact. Uh, so when she was recruited um, in Australia, I think she started out first as a research fellow. Um, it was a very ambitious project. The project was to develop the infrastructure for um, building a quantum computer with semiconductors, with mainstream semiconductors. Um, and the idea here was, a theory, uh, was an idea proposed by someone in the 1990s. It was a basic idea was that, um, imagine that you could make a single atom um, transistor. So, so basically a semiconductor device where you have a single phosphorus donor in that, you know, in silicon, and you use the electron bound to that phosphorus donor as essentially a, um, a quantum state, as a, as a quantum bit. Um, no one knew how to do it at the time. There were some people trying to do this with um, iron implantation, you know, trying to implant phosphorus ions, which really wasn't working very well because you didn't have the spatial resolution needed. But um, Michelle really started the whole um, 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 process in Australia of building up the infrastructure for doing this with scanning tunneling microscopes. So the idea here was to take silicon and to have hydrogen passivated silicon and then with, um, um, with an STM in the presence of um, phosphine that you saturate the silicon surface with, you take advantage of the surface chemistry and dangling bonds and so on to create a, um, a single, you know, well, well precisely defined um, um, donor atom. And so if you look at that figure A, that's a scanning tunneling microscope image of one of these atoms that is, um, that is located in between four um, um, electrodes that, um, that you also define you know, with, with this kind of STM lithography. Um, and so this has now become a, a leading candidate for a scalable approach to solid state quantum computing architecture. Um, it's achieving a lot of attention because it's compatible with existing CMOS technology infrastructure. And, um, and it relies on the long spin lifetimes that one has uh, in semiconductors. And there's a nice interesting connection there with Penn State that I can tell you all about um, at some other time, because um, in some experiments that were done between my group and, uh, and another group at Santa Barbara, just about that time, we showed that semiconductors could have very long electron spin coherence times. Um, so Michelle has been you know, in contact with us for a long time um, because of all these um, nice overlaps. So could I go to the next slide then? Um, yeah, so, so here's the current status of the research now. So what I showed you on the earlier slide was the first result where they demonstrated the ability to locate precisely these single phosphorus atoms, right, the donors. And now they're at the stage where they can locate um, pairs of these um, atoms near each other. And these then um, uh, act as qubits and they've been able to demonstrate by, um, by building uh, devices in which one has, uh, which, in which one can do spectroscopy at the single electron level, um, you can demonstrate two qubit exchange gates between phosphorus donor electron spin qubits that are located near each other. And they can do that with a pretty reasonable readout fidelity of about something like 94%. So this is a really important step. Um, uh, one important message to the students is that, look at this paper with the two qubit exchange gate, that's 2019. The earlier paper where they demonstrated the ability to place a you know, phosphorus atom and address it was 2012. 
And she actually started working on this something like in 2000 or so. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a good message that sometimes you go after an ambitious problem um, and you, know, you work at it for decades and get it to work. You know? And she's, they've now started a company. She has a company in, in Australia um, uh, on the silicon quantum computing. Intel has uh, gotten a lot of attention um, because they've started going after these types of transistors. Uh, she was able to recruit a leading person from Google to join her company and head it. So, you know, this is, I think, just a fantastic example of a scientist who has taken huge risks and, um, and done some amazing things for science and a real inspiration for young scientists these days. So it's a pleasure talking about her. She's been to Penn State. She's given one plenary lecture at a conference that I co-organized a couple of years ago. And I hope to get her back here to talk to both the physics and materials communities um, when the pandemic is over. Many thanks, Nitin. Next up, we have Clive Randall. I know Clive was having some sound issues. Thank you very much. I think we've got them solved now. Can you everybody hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay, great. So it's my great pleasure to, to represent Suzanne Moni. But before um, going into our colleague, um, just want to draw attention to, to, for the students on um, the MRI pioneers and materials, uh, um, which can be found on the MRI website. And a number of women that we've highlighted over the last few years, uh, Mary Willard, uh, Pauline Mack, Della Roy, uh, Dorothy Quiggle, and then also the collective women that, that came to Penn State to really uh, drive the engineering program during World War II. Um, and many of them uh, uh, were pioneers at that time, just as this generation of women that we're talking about today are also um, inspiring and still pushing, the, pushing a more equitable gender um, portfolio in science. Um, my pleasure is to, to talk about Suzanne Moni. Uh, she's a professor here since 2004 and also has a, uh, a title of professor in electrical engineering. And her work is really basically folding um, the material science of particularly electrical contacts um, um, into electrical devices. So understanding the materials aspect of that all the way through. And I think it's always interesting to see how people arrive at where they did. And so she was actually a rebel in her family. Uh, uh, she was in a very artistic family, um, most of the musicians, and then she studied science, being influenced by watching the Apollo launches on TV, which is certainly part of our generation. Um, she had a very nice um, uh, teacher in terms of a father and um, using his telescope and looking at the stars. Uh, she had an interest in photography, so that uh, the chemical processing of um, uh, of, of of the darkroom activities there, and also just collecting uh, geological specimens and materials um, to cover many of the different elements. And at school, she was no surprise, valedictorian, Victorian, and also voted uh, best citizen. So next slide, please. Yeah, so as I said, a lot of her interests have really been in the, in the space of um, uh, electronics and photonics. And in particular, she's been embracing the, um, the aspects of um, deposition in the terms of first physical vapor deposition. And then after her sabbatical at Argonne National Labs, really then started off a really robust program uh, here at Penn State on atomic layer deposition um, of, of um, really trying to understand better the, the interfaces between the contact and the semiconductor. And she also uses a variety of, of, of techniques with her group, TEM, uh, spectroscopy techniques, and of course, AFM. And she's been a very important player to a lot of our semiconducting activities from the MERSEX through to the new uh, 2DCC area, covering materials such as silicon, silicon carbide, uh, the, the, the nitrides, and also the arsenides, as well as now the new calcogenides in the 2D materials effort. And she's also uh, taken a lot of leadership roles, um, such as um, she was chief uh, editor for, for Electronics Material Journal. Next slide, please. Yeah, so, so 
uh, her whole area is, uh, uh, she was one of the pioneers in this area. There was, there was some initial work done at Bell Labs, Fry, Kurtz, Meads, and others, really worrying about the thermochemistry of an interface. But, it, uh, but she has then really adapted the thermodynamics and the kinetics of the, uh, of the processing that is then required to then understand the Fermi level pinning and the Bardeen limit all the way through to the completion characteristics that you would get at a non-omic Schottky type contact. Next slide, please. And to come back to, remember right at the beginning, I said when she was in school, um, she was uh, re regarded as a best citizen. I can't say that that, that 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 has ever changed within her. Her citizenship for education and for the research mission at Penn State has been absolutely fabulous, organizing many different things. And uh, even here in the pandemic, I'm just gonna pull out one of these examples, creating a North American materials colloquium series uh, to give visibility and understanding for students and postdocs in the United States and Canada, right in these difficult days of 2020, 2021. So an absolute uh, joy as a colleague and um, an absolute leader um, in her field and always thinking about other people and her citizenship is still there even from those very early days. So thank you. Thank you, Clive. Next up we have Jim Adair. Uh, I, I was inspired by Katherine Johnson uh, and let me give a little bit of background. I grew up in South Florida in a little town called Jupiter, not so little now. Uh, and in 1960, President Kennedy authorized NASA to, to uh, get the first men on the moon before the end of that decade. And of course, he didn't live to see it being assassinated in 63. But we kids growing up in South Florida remember being marched out onto the playgrounds uh, of the various schools throughout South Florida and presumably throughout Florida. And we would see the launch of the various astronauts. And the first step in, in achieving the moon was called the Mercury program. This was single man launches. The, the first one to go up was Alan Shepard. Didn't see him, he went up in the summertime when most of us were on vacation. But the second man to go up was John Glenn. And uh, so we knew all about all of these astronauts, but I knew nothing about the mathematics underlying the predicted trajectories, which you had to have to know where the astronauts would land uh, until I saw the movie Hidden Figures that came out in 2016. I uh, began to look at Katherine Johnson's career. She was a prodigy. She, she did not ever go to first grade. They started her in second grade. By the time she was 18, she had graduated from college with a BS in uh, mathemat uh, mathematics and French. Uh, she was one of the first black students integrated into West Virginia graduate schools but she was already married and she got pregnant after the first semester and had to drop out. And subsequently, she, she in 1955, when NASA was morphing from the old NACA program, she, she applied late, was rejected, but the next round of hiring, she was employed by 1956. And during Glenn's flight, there, there were a lot of complications and, and with respect, which I'll cover on the next slide, but with respect to predicting the trajectory and, and where the astronaut would land. She was also responsible and helped to do the trajectories for the first men to the moon. She also wrote a book on space travel, literally, and she's cited by one of the NASA directors there. She contributed to the plans for a Mars mission before she ultimately retired. In 2015, she was given the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Barack Obama. And eventually, at 75 years after she dropped out of graduate school, she received an honorary doctorate degree from West Virginia University. According to the institution, 
She earned the honor by attaining national and international preeminence in the field of astrophysics and providing distinguished leadership and service in her field. And as you'll see, it was well-deserved. Could you, you should go to the next slide, Enrique? So on the left-hand side is the technical wrote she co-wrote in September, 1960 with, with uh, Shapinsky. Uh, and this was the, the layout for how to use numerical calculations to determine the angle at burnout for placing the satellite over a selected Earth position. Why was this important? Well, in the, the, the other space power at the time, the Soviet Union, <clears throat> were landing their satellites in the middle of, of the large tracts of open land they had in Russia. In contrast, the United States decided to do sea landings, uh, easier on the satellite, easier on the, the astronaut. And as a consequence, that they had to precisely place the ships that were going to pick up the satellite and astronaut uh, and very quickly uh, after they landed. The mathematical issues dealt with, with mostly the seven things that I have written down here. They could, the trajectory for basic aircraft flight was pretty well nailed down. Earth's rotation, taking that into account. Wind variability, taking that into account. But the, the, if, if you're in low level flight where the gravity is essentially the same, the, you, there's no problem with the fact that Earth is actually not very round. Uh, and so they had to adjust for the Earth oblateness. Furthermore, they had to adjust for the variable gravity because the thrust by the satellite will vary. It, it will tend to increase, of course, as the gravity diminishes uh, upon sending the uh, aircraft or spacecraft into orbit. Fuel expenditure versus mass loss and momentum also are constantly changing. Then the azimuth angle on re-entry was a critical angle with a very small window that permitted the ablation field to serve its purpose on the bottom part of these Mercury single man space capsules, but uh, were losing mass as they were, were landing, which would affect the reentry. Uh, and then, so they had to precisely generate what we now call GPS splashdown location for the sea pickup. And, and there had only been one man before from the United States before Glenn Allen Shepard. And basically he was shot up and came right back down. The uh, objective for Glenn's flight was to do three full orbitals of the earth before he, he made re-entry. Now, Glenn was a, a very well-prepared test pilot. Before that, he was a Marine ace in Korea. Uh, and he was a very pragmatic fellow uh, but in spite of the electronic computers they had at the time, he didn't really trust them very much. And the way he put it in, in his face, faith in Katherine Johnson was, if she says they're good, the calculations, in other words, then I'm ready to go. Now, I have this technical note if you'd like to take a look at it. It's a beautiful depiction of something they didn't really cover in the, in the movie. That they explained it, it, what she contributed as Euler's uh, uh, method, which is kind of an incremental, partly numerical approach, but doesn't tell the whole story. What Katherine Johnson knew was that they were going to have to do numerical calculations that take into account all these variables uh, incrementally uh, throughout the uh, flight. And of course, Glenn had some issues because some of his ablation field was shredding off before he ever returned. Next uh, slide, Enrique. Now, there were three women with Katherine Johnson, the, the lead person. Dorothy Vaughn and Mary Jackson became famous at NASA, if not anywhere else in the world until 
2016, they were considered the human computers who calculated the trajectories. And of course, by the time we hit Apollo, we had actual computers that worked in real time and were getting somewhat smaller than the warehouse size computers that were necessary. Uh, that's all I have, but I wanted to recognize Katherine Johnson in particular, as well as her two counterparts, Dorothy Vaughn and Mary Jackson, because they were not only magnificent mathematicians, they, they had, um, they, they were black women on top of it, all growing up in the South and all rising to the high, one of the highest levels at NASA. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Next up, we have uh, JP Maria. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Enrique. So it is my pleasure to say a few words about uh, again, one of our own, Professor Susan Collier McKinstry. So a very brief uh, micro CV is as follows. Uh, Dr. McKinstry did her, um, all of her degrees at Penn State in ceramic science and ceramic science and engineering. Um, she spent her career at Penn State as assistant associate and now full professor, uh, where she was um, held the chair, the student, uh, Stuart S. Flashen uh, professor chair. Um, and as I think many of us know, uh, she was elected into the National Academy in 2019. And she is one of 20 Evan Pugh professors uh, that have been named this millennium. So uh, you know, I, I think we don't need to belabor the many uh, accomplishments of Dr. McKinstry. I would rather focus on what's not on a CV. So next slide. Okay, so Susan has what many would career consider a very challenging uh, career path. Uh, she was joining the faculty in the early 90s. And at that time, there was a, a very long list of very accomplished people working in the area of ferroelectrics and piezoelectrics. And one is forced to wonder amidst this really unparalleled expertise in the United States, uh, how can one possibly you know, be successful and distinguish, them, distinguish themselves? And that list there is just you know, for one building. That was the old uh, materials research laboratory. And I will note that you know, this was in a time period that um, let's, say, let's just say where diversity was not nearly as um, valued as it, was, as it is today. So next slide. So how did Susan do it? Um, Really, she focused on the science. She found a different career path and she stuck to the plan. At the time, piezoelectrics and ferroelectrics were very important at Penn State. Uh, ferroelectric thin films were important in terms of memory. People were just starting to think about piezoelectric uh, micro, micro mechanical systems. So Susan identified that, that niche and she focused on piezoelectric film characterization, piezoelectric thin film preparation, and really she started what is probably the preeminent piezo MEMS program to date in the United States, perhaps um, in the world. The science issues that she focused on really was domain walls. Susan wanted to know everything about domain walls. How many are there? How big are they? What and when and how can I make them move? Okay, next slide. Okay, so she, she came a long way and I demonstrate here uh, just so I, I want, my goal here is to demonstrate the sophistication that has been achieved and the, let's say, the very modest beginnings of, of her group. So on the very far uh, left side is a, is a drawing uh, from a guy named Joe Shepard. Uh, Joe Shepard was one of the four or so uh, first people to join uh, Dr. McKinstry's group uh, along with myself. And Joe made this device, we used to laugh about it and call it the Joe meter. And it, you know, it looks kind of clunky and it was pretty crude at the time, but investing in that basic capability really changed the way that people thought about measuring piezoelectric thin films. And despite the simplicity of these devices, the papers are cited hundreds of times and many people have, um, have duplicated them. So there's a photograph there of, uh, from 1998. So this is sort of Susan's inaugural uh, class of graduate students. Um, you know, Joe's on the right, I'm in the center, and then the other guy on the, on the right is um, a guy named Brady Gibbons. He's now the Associate Dean of Research at Oregon State's um, College of Engineering in their Okay, which group now routinely builds. And I also show a, um, an image of the NanoFab 
And I just, for those of you who don't know, Susan has been a driving force in making the nanofab into one of the preeminent institutions or fabrication facilities that will handle complex oxides and fully process sophisticated piezoelectric devices. Okay, next slide. So what has she done in her spare time? Uh, I'm not gonna go through this list. Service, she's been a leader and a director and a president uh, in, in national societies. She's been recognized by the highest honors in her field, including the National Academy and at Penn State, the Evan Proof Professorship. The impact is astounding. 64 graduate students and postdocs, 19 people from her group in faculty positions internationally, hundreds of papers, thousands of citations, you know, a textbook. And more than that, Susan really defines what I consider to be the gold standard for integrity in teaching and in science. Next slide. So a few observations. As many of you know, Susan published a book uh, about two or three years ago. Uh, this book was initiated by uh, Susan's advisor, Dr. Newnham. Susan took it upon herself to finish it. And as a testament to her selflessness, you know, you'll notice here I, the price of that book, $66. That's cheap by today's standards. Susan fought hard with the publisher to keep the price down. And she's taking proceeds from that book and dedicating them to um, to uh, the Dr. Newnham, um, Dr. Newnham's, uh, um, his, uh, the, the chair that we're uh, developing for in Dr. Newnham's name. So again, selflessness. And one more slide. Okay. And I show this picture for a couple of reasons. So this is obviously Susan on an airplane. So a few things to note, right? If you count carefully, there's nine seats on that airplane. So that's a wide body jet, which means that Susan's probably flying over an ocean. And from the era of this picture, I'm pretty sure she was flying to Japan. Now, I want you to ask yourself, what's she doing? If you look carefully at what she has in her hands, it's tests, right? So how many senior professors, right, leaders in their field will carry two kilograms of student exams and grade them by hand on an airplane while flying to Japan? So it's a, a, just a testament to Susan's dedication to both research and teaching and integrity as a faculty member. So thank you. Thank you, JP. Okay, next up we have Eiji Han. Okay, thank you. So I decided to uh, talk about uh, Tu Youyou, who is a Chinese uh, pharmaceutical chemist. Um, so for those of you who is not that familiar with her work, her major contribution was uh, extracting an active material uh, from a Chinese uh, from traditional Chinese herbs that can actively treat uh, malaria. So um, some of her, her short CV. So uh, she was born in 1930 and in 1955, she got her bachelor's degree from uh, Peking University School of uh, Medicine. So right after that, she started working in uh, Academy of Traditional Chinese Medicine. Um, so you can see that she did not really do a master or doctoral degree because back then in China, we didn't really have this uh, degree thing. So uh, she kind of did her master studies uh, while she was working at the uh, Academy of uh, Traditional Chinese Medicine. And um, from 1959 to 1962, uh, she start, uh, She was uh, learning this uh, course that's using the traditional Chinese medicine, uh, gear, gearing towards the uh, researchers who are uh, focusing more on the Western medicine, which is a uh, very, uh, very much promoted back in 1950s uh, back uh, in China because uh, we were trying to combine uh, traditional Chinese medicine with the modern Western medicine as um, there were a lot of ar arguments uh -huh. against uh, the traditional Chinese medicine as it is a pseudoscience, but um, their, uh, their research really uh, that this combination really uh, promoted a lot of people to study more about this uh, traditional Chinese medicine and how it works, why it is effective. And uh, in 1990, she uh, start, uh, She was appointed as a professor at the uh, Academy of uh, Traditional Chinese Medicine. And now uh, at the age of 90, she is uh, still actively involved in, um, the, in her work with uh, treating malaria. So if you could go to the next slide. Uh, so her, her work with uh, treating malaria really started from uh, 1960s over, uh, that's in the time of uh, Vietnam War, where um, there was a breakout of malaria in Southeast Asia. Um, and um, the, 
um, the medicine that was used back then, which is probably quinine, was uh, not effective anymore because the parasites started to have some uh, drug resistance uh, against that medicine. So then uh, the researchers around the world was trying to uh, find treatment to uh, uh, solve this uh, malaria breakout back in 1960s. So, um, so Tuyoyo's uh, group was working on um, finding the treatment from the traditional Chinese medicine. And their methodology was searching from the ancient Chinese text and uh, seeking for the herbs and uh, cures for the fevers that's caused by malaria. And um, so you can see that, that our team identified the 640 plants and more than 200 uh, remedies. And uh, in the end, they found uh, this, um, they found this plant that's called a ching hao, which is um, a type of sweet wormwood. And that's uh, from a traditional Chinese pre uh, prescription from uh, about 1700 years ago. And um, so they were trying to find, uh, they were trying to find the extract from this sweet wormwood. And um, so initially they were trying to use this high temperature extraction, but then this high temperature uh, method was actually destroying the structure of the active ingredients. So then uh, Yoyo has found that by using cold temperature extraction in ethyl ether, they were able to extract the active ingredient, which is this RT missing. Um, and um, they also identified the chemical structure of this uh, ingredient. And if you could go to the next slide, please. So um, in 1973, they, uh, they produced a, a, an effective anti-malaria drug that's called uh, dihydroartemisinine uh, using the, um, the, the extract that they found from the sweet wormwood. And actually back in 1977, the work was published anonymously. It's, uh, so that's kind of uh, what's going on back, uh, back in 1970s in China because uh, we were trying to credit the group uh, over uh, crediting individual uh, individual scientists. So uh, their work was actually only having an author. That's uh, the group of uh, the uh, the name of the group that contributed to the work uh, to the work. And um, then after two decades, uh, the WHO uh, recommended um, the artemisinin combination therapy. Um, to, as the first line of defense against malaria, malaria and then if actually saved the millions of lives. Um, so here is a structure of uh, the Artemis name that they identified from um, the traditional Chinese herbs. And I, I really found her work very inspirational as, um, as it promotes more people to be more interested in uh, the traditional Chinese medicine. Since we have this, uh, we have this thousand years of uh, traditional Chinese medicine experience, it's really, um, it's really a pity if we just uh, throw all these culture away and then only focusing on the uh, modern uh, medicine just because we don't understand what's going on with the traditional ways. And uh, for her work, uh, uh, Yo Yo Tu has uh, received the, the Lasker Award in uh, 2011. And then she also have, uh, has won half of the Nobel Prize in uh, 2015 in physiology and uh, medicine. So uh, that's all I prepared. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, next up, we have Vin Crespi. So I'm gonna talk about Joan Redwing and uh, it's my delight to do that. Um, I uh, chose this title because uh, there's a, you know, a stereotype in academia that uh, sometimes great accomplishments correlate with uh, difficult personalities. And, and I think Joan is an example of of the precise opposite with great accomplishments and a great generosity of spirit as well. And I think it's, it's really important to have those examples. So she was born in Pennsylvania um, outside of Pittsburgh and her, uh, and her PhD at Wisconsin um, on 3.5 semiconductors by MOCVD and then uh, spent some years um, in industry and uh, worked at, um, with one of the uh, very first 3.5 nitride MOCBDs. And I, I didn't have my, I meant to click a little bit later. So in, in addition to working on one of the very first uh, uh, nitride MOCBDs, she also created life at that point, which, uh, which I continue to find kind of amazing. 
And I, uh, I did something on this slide that Joan wouldn't do. I put her name in giant letters and I cropped out two other people um, from each slide. Um, but so she doesn't get mad at me. I put their names down there in the corner. So her, her thesis advisor and a colleague um, at ATMI. In 1999, Joan uh, came to Penn State as an assistant professor in MATSI and electrical engineering. And here she is wearing the uh, Nittany Lion suit in front of the uh, statue. I wanted to highlight, uh, oh yes, and created life again. I wanted to highlight a few of uh, her accomplishments in research since uh, coming to Penn State. Um, first, these exquisite um, nanowire systems. So silicon, germanium, other materials. Uh, one of the things that, that I grew as a theorist to appreciate in collaborating uh, with experimentalists and growers is that it's, you know, it's growing something is not, is not the point. It's growing really good stuff um, is the sign of mastery. And here you can see these absolutely beautiful nanowire arrays, which actually act as solar cells. They're not, they're not just simply nanowires. They have controlled doping and junctions built into them. And, and Joan is part of a, a whole series of work um, on nanowires and uh, all of which is built on, on the mastery of the growth as the, the fundamental enabling principle. Um, also really high quality films of magnesium diboride. She played a key role in these as well very smooth and, and of a quality that's very important for the superconducting properties in that system. Also the encapsulation of these exquisite bilayers of 2D gallium nitride. Um, she played a key role in this and many other things as well. Um, uh, this work done, done in, uh, um, in her lab. And this, this work is burgeoning now and going off in all sorts of new directions. Seems to be a new platform for 2D materials that are stable in the air. And then finally, this is, this is one that it, it, uh, um, it, it brings out one of, these, one of these interesting qualities of growers. So this is a wafer scale near single crystal uh, monolayer of a transition metal dichalcogenide. And as a naive theorist, you know, looking at it, you know, I don't get terribly excited. I see a gray, a sort of you know, brownish gray circle but the fact that there's nothing to see is the key to, to how amazing it is. I mean, you can zoom in on this and there's also very little to see because it's so uniform and so perfect across the uh, uh, entire scale of that wafer. Now this last advance is part of a, uh, okay, something happened on this slide when it got uh, jumped between um, operating systems. So I wasn't going to read out all those words anyway, so I guess that's okay. So sort of as a, as a, a real culmination of this, this history of, uh, of mastery of growth has been um, in these past few years uh, where Joan has uh, assumed the directorship of uh, NSF Materials Innovation Platform. This is, it was a completely new program at the time, and only two of these were founded in the United States um, in that initial call. Um, and they were to help recapture the US lead in growth of, um, of uh, hard, hard condensed matter systems. And in this case, 2D materials. This is the flagship for US efforts in the growth of 2D materials. It's a national user facility. And what got sort of expanded somehow in the text there is the mission statement. And I just highlighted words related um, to, uh, to growth and discovery and leadership and also service. There's a combination of in-house research and service as a user community, um, which I think really encapsulates the, the research excellence side of Joan and also the generosity of spirit in, in her leadership, her, her uh, excellent leadership of this national user facility, the first of its kind in the US. I showed here a series of concentric circles. I'm not gonna go through the details, but this is a big operation. This has many layers of impact on the community, both within Penn State and reaching out well beyond Penn State to the whole 2D research community. And uh, let's see if, 
the build comes in, there we go. And again, just to give you a feel for the, 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 the level of activity that Joan has been directing here, this, this um, upward trajectory in publications coming out of the platform as a whole, including some that are really high impact. One thing I wanna note is the, uh, the, the goal here, 2D Crystal Consortium was 2D calcogenides and 90% of the papers of the consortium are on 2D calcogenides. That may seem obvious, but to actually hold to a mission with that level of fidelity in academia is a real testament to leadership in and of itself um, on top of all of the great science that has come out of this and all of the great activities on, on as you can see in that right-hand side, a huge number of you know, facets to the activity of the 2D Crystal Consortium. And, and Joan's leadership is, has been you know, absolutely enabling to all of these. Thank you, Vin. So next up we have uh, Tom Niggle, who are talking about uh, Carlito Chief. Tom, it's all yours. Great, thank you, Dr. Gomez. So I wanna start uh, my quick slides on Dr. Carlito Chief with a quick land, land acknowledgement. So I just wanted to acknowledge that all of us today, as well as Penn State as a whole, sits upon the original homelands of the Conestoga, also known as the Susquehannock people. And as a land grant university, which Penn State is, bestowed through the 1862 Morrill Act. The US government expropriated land from the Conestoga and other indigenous peoples from the area to use for educational purposes. And as such, I and other members of our community must acknowledge this and make sure to improve the lives of indigenous people who remain in the area and those who come to the area for an education. And we acknowledge and thank the original stewards of this wonderful land and recognize the enduring presence of indigenous peoples on this land. All right, next slide. So Dr. Carletta Chief, a uh, picture on the right, right there. So she was born in the Navajo Nation in the Southwestern United States. And she self-identifies as a member of the Bitterwater Clan and as a Diné woman, which is the adjective for someone from the Navajo Nation. So she was a first generation college student leaving her, uh, leaving her group and she graduated with a BS and MS in civil and environmental engineering from Stanford University. And not only that, but she also earned a PhD at University of Arizona in hydrology. And hydrology is the study of how water flows through both uh, natural and as well as artificial man-made systems uh, and how and their impacts on the environment. And now she is an associate professor at University of Arizona in environmental sciences. All right, so she was inspired originally by the environmental destruction of her hometown, which is Black Mesa, Arizona. Although she witnessed the destruction of topsoil and vegetation, and there was a mine nearby that not only had often waste and slurry spills that spilled into waterways in her homeland, but there was also a mine explosion nearby. And with that coupled with air pollution respiratory diseases that affected her, her, her family and her community, she sought to get out of the Navajo Nation to earn education and to be able to return to use her knowledge and her talents to help her community. So Dr. Chief currently, uh, her research works on solving challenges at the food energy water nexus, specifically in indigenous communities, a lot with the Navajo Nation. And she uses a lot of methods that also are very inclusive with their traditional values to try to establish this bridge similar to, um, similar to other scientists where they work with the natural community as well as with scientific advances. And she also established the first hydrology extension program in the US. So the first program to actually use hydrology as a field to work with, uh, work with the local communities as a form of outreach to really understand and get feedback from them and build that into her research and her developments and how they can solve those problems. All right, next slide. All right, next. and so on the right here is the Animas River, which is in the Southwest US. And in 2015, there was a mine, uh, the Gold King mine that actually spilled into the river. And as you can see here, there was a lot of environmental damage. And part of that resulted in the Navajo people being economically and spiritually devastated because their 
livelihoods in terms of growing their crops. It was during the crop growing season, so it ruined their harvest for the entire year. But in addition to that, they use it as part of their spiritual beliefs, and the river plays a large part in that. And so seeing it so environmentally damaged was devastating to everyone there. And she didn't see this as just something that was horrible to happen, but she took action. And she was able to speak with a large number of people in the community and answered many of their questions within two weeks of the spill, using all of her knowledge and all of her resources to be able to comfort and establish trust with the community that she's been a part of. And then following that, she secured over a million dollars of money in research, uh, research funds to research their questions because often community members, although they are not as necessarily technically um, technically trained in a lot of these type of scientific fields, they often have very good and very insightful questions. And so they were, she was able to recognize that and turn that into an opportunity to answer their questions and also understand the effects of this spill. And so because she took the time to listen to them and their concerns and as a member of their community, plus using her uh, advanced scientific training from her education, she was able to build rebuild trust within the community after such a horrific event. So I just wanted to talk about how wonderful Dr. Kalera Chief is. She's not only an excellent researcher who focuses on bridging science with community, something that I also have, uh, am, am very inspired by, but she also addressed these water disparities with a strong, respectful collaboration with the community to make sure that not only do they feel heard and trusted, but to know that she is able to work with them and build this sense of how important the science is and also how important their abilities and their questioning is. And overall, it just creates a much more wonderful ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Next up, we have Scott Henninger. Thank you, Enrique. Uh, today's my pleasure to highlight uh, Dr. Elizabeth Cup. Libby, as we know her, uh, received her BS degree from uh, Ceramic Science and Engineering at Penn State back when we had the individual sections. Uh, after which she got hired at Kenna Metal uh, in Ceramics Research Group uh, in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. After five years, she returned to Penn State for graduate work and earned her PhD in Material Science and Engineering. And then she spent the next two years at Oak Ridge, Oak Ridge National Labs as a postdoctoral research associate. After returning to Pennsylvania, uh, Libby decided to uh, come to Dr. Messing's group and in uh, ceramics processing research. She's currently an associate teaching professor and a director of advanced materials processing lab. Uh, all right, thanks. Um, Libby's research activities uh, in uh, over the years uh, in ceramic processing include transparent, transparent ceramics for solid state laser gain media, porous ceramics for gas filtration applications, thermomechanical analysis of materials for solid state or solid oxide fuel electrodes, and studies on the centering behavior of ceramics as a function of the precise dopant and purity concentrations. In addition uh, to her role as a research scientist, she also teaches the undergraduate laboratory courses, advises undergraduate students, advises the materials, material advantage student uh, professional society chapter at Penn State, and plays a leading role in the department's out, outreach uh, recruiting efforts. She's active in the, in the Materials Research Society as a subcommittee chair on, and on the University's Commission of uh, Racial and Ethnic, Ethnic Diversity, and in addition to serving on the variety of uh, department and college committees. Next slide. So, uh, Libby's been a longtime advocate of safety, uh, and all of her work uh, really helps keep us safe. Just a, a few of her accomplishments uh, in 2012, she was chosen to participate in the Dow uh, Safety Initiative in Midland, Michigan, 
along with other representatives from MATC, chemical engineering, and chemistry departments. 2013, she formally joined the, the MSAO, the uh, MATC Safety Committee, and has been a driving force to enhance safety, uh, the safety culture and department ever since. In 2016, Libby created the Lab Safety Manager uh, course, the LSM, uh, formalized the process where student leaders uh, in laboratory safety can earn credit for their efforts and participation as lab safety leaders. In 2017, she successfully migrated the safety exam from Angel to Canvas. This is when Canvas was uh, taken over for Angel. Um, 2018, she researched and started using special software to streamline the documentations of the uh, laboratory safety inspections. And in 2020, she initiated the purchase of department so supplied lab coats for all the researchers. So I just want to personally thank Libby for all her contributions to enhance the department. That's Many it. thanks, Scott. Okay. Next up, we have Allison Beasy. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so first of all, I wanna thank Enrique for organizing this event. I really appreciate it. So I chose to highlight Mildred Dresselhaus, or Millie as she was known. And there's a lot to say about her, so I'm gonna highlight a bit about her background, and then I'll talk a little bit about her science and awards, and then also her work for women. Next, oh no, keep it on this slide. Okay, so Millie was born in 1930, and she grew up in the Bronx during the Great Depression. She got her undergrad degree at Hunter College, where a future Nobel laureate and physics professor, Rosalind Yallo, recognized her gift for science and encouraged her to pursue a graduate degree in physics. So she spent a year at Cambridge University, then a year at Harvard, and finally she completed her PhD at the University of Chicago, where she often walked to campus with Enrico, Enrico Fermi during the last year of his life. And so after grad school, she served as a postdoc at Cornell University, then she became a staff member at MIT Lincoln Lab before finally joining the MIT faculty in electrical engineering and computer science in 1967. Next slide, please. Okay, so Millie um, was the first tenured female faculty member at MIT and she was known as the queen of carbon. And she made foundational contributions in graphite, fullerenes and carbon nanotubes, as well as low dimensional thermoelectrics. And she was a true pioneer in nanoscience. So as noted in an MIT technology review article, I quote, she was the first to exploit the thermoelectric effect at the nanoscale to efficiently harvest energy from temperature differences in materials that conduct electricity. And she was one of the first scientists to imagine that it was possible to make carbon nanotubes, writing a paper postulating that it would be possible to make semiconducting or metallic carbon nanotubes simply by altering their geometry very slightly, end quote. So she studied nanotechnology before it was even considered a field, and she did it while raising four children. So she received a number of awards, only a few of which are captured here, uh, some of the more notable ones. So um, she was the first and so far only woman to win the National Medal of Science and Engineering, and she did that in 1990. She was the first woman to win the IEEE Medal of Honor, and she was awarded that in 2015, which was 98 years after its inception. She was a winner of the Enrique Fermi Award, um, winner of Presidential Medal of Freedom, and she was the winner and first solo recipient of the Copley Prize in Nanoscience. Next slide, please. So I'd like to highlight a bit more personally her impact on women in science and engineering. So Millie made it a point for almost 50 years to meet almost daily with groups of women to discuss issues they faced at MIT. And she used her voice to highlight the roadblocks women faced in science, engineering, and academia. I was fortunate to meet Millie for the first time in 2008 when I was a grad student at MIT, and she was a keynote speaker for a program MIT developed for female grad students and postdocs, which was called Path of Professorship, and it was aimed at providing females with tools to enter and succeed in academia. And I just remember her as being immensely inspiring. She was pioneering both her scientific achievements and her efforts at pr promoting the inclusion of women. She relayed a couple of anecdotes that have since been published in many articles about her. The first was that her PhD advisor told her that women had no place in science. And the second was that a senior faculty member at Cornell told her that women can't teach engineers. 
And I'll note that at this event, she was disappointed, but not entirely surprised that many of us in attendance had had similar conversations and encounters so many years later. But she provided a true example of courage, grit, and perseverance, and was an absolute inspiration. So while Millie's contributions to science and engineering have had and will continue to have a measurable impact, so have and will her contributions to women in science and engineering. And I, for one, am truly grateful to have known her. Thank you. Many thanks, Allison. Next up, we have Haley Meyer. Great, thanks. Um, today, I'm going to be honoring Dr. Amy Robinson. So you can go to the next slide. So a bit about Dr. Robinson, she got her bachelor's and her master's in material science from Penn State in 2001 and 2003. And then after that, for the next four years, she went to work as a materials engineer at the Naval Surface Warfare Center. And then she loved Penn State so much, so she came back for her PhD in material science in 2007 from Penn State. Um, for the next two years, she worked as a research associate for the Penn State Applied Research Lab. And then in 2008, she started her role that she currently holds, which is the associate teaching professor. Um, currently, she teaches multiple MATC classes, all of which I've been lucky enough to take. So those are MATC 427, which is a ferrous alloys class, MATC 497, which is a non-ferrous alloys class, MATC 425, which is a metals processing class, and then 471, which is the metals processing lab. Um, when she's not teaching, she's the advisor for Material Advantage, which I've been involved in for the past four years, so I've gotten to know her through that. Um, when we were still going to ms &T, so this was last year, last October, um, she was, you know, working very closely with the president at the time to organize the flights and organize the hotels and you know trying to make it a good experience for the students and then she is also the chair so the head of the Penn State ASM chapter so you can go to the next slide so thinking about like um, honoring Dr. Robinson I think the main thing is her student impact so like I said I've been fortunate enough to take four of her classes and one thing that really sticks out to me is she on the very first day always has um, a paper that has all of the students' pictures and all the students' names. And from the first day, she's trying to remember every student's name, which is kind of a breath of fresh air coming from, you know, big freshman lecture halls where the professor could care less, you know, how much you're learning or what your grade is. And then having a teacher who truly cares about what you're learning and, you know, is trying to remember your name and will call you by name. Um, Dr. Robinson also organizes industry tours, which is, you know, above and beyond what professors have to do. So my sophomore year, we visited um, a steel mill and that was kind of what solidified to me that I wanted to work in the metals industry. So that was definitely very impactful. And she's always willing to give information about jobs, you know, multiple times in classes. She'll share information that she knows about jobs. Um, I had lost my internship due to COVID this past summer. So I reached out to her and she gave me, you know, a whole slew of information and people that I could reach out to. And so, you know, in preparation for this talk, I actually reached out to some of my friends who had Dr. Robinson. So I have three, if you will, testimonials that I'll read now. So the first one says, um, Dr. Robinson made class personal by interacting with her students during class, and she cares about the success of all of her students. And then the second one says, the way she taught and tested her students was beneficial to actually growing our knowledge. Her assignments required us to truly understand how the whole system acts together and not just remember one bit of information. And I think that one really hits the nail on the head, the head of Dr. Robinson's teaching style. She, she truly wants you to understand. And then the last one says, her lectures made you understand how everything you learned is applicable in the real world. She always related content back to industry or something we may, to, may need to do on the job. So I think those, those three quotes really encompass, you know, how much of an impact Dr. Robinson really has on the students. So, you know, I have no doubt that she'll continue to impact students in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Haley. Next up, we have Roman. Roman Engelherbert. 
Thanks, Enrica. Um, so I want to uh, take you on a little journey that I uh, went through a couple of years ago when I was trying to work out a captivating introduction to X-ray diffraction. So I was sitting uh, at home thinking about how to best visualize the relationship of atomic arrangement and X-ray diffraction images for a MATSI 430 course. And uh, I wanted to convey two things, one of which is what is this relationship? And we know it's Fourier transform, but I didn't want to say Fourier transform. And I wanted to do this ideally with an X-ray photograph, uh, maybe an iconic X-ray photograph that has really um, moved uh, and improved our understanding of uh, certain things in science. Um, and so I found this, this photograph number 51, which you're seeing here, and it, it, it immediately uh, interests me because you can really see that there's an interesting structure of the specimen uh, that have been photographed. And if you go to the next slide, um, you can see that this really had an impact. Um, this photograph was published in, in Nature in 1953, and it was a follow-up um, um, a follow-up work um, of the, the theoretical model uh, of the structure of DNA. And you can see how uh, the, the, the tilt angle, um, the distance between the base pairs and uh, the distance of complete turns in the helix are actually uh, almost directly can be read out from this, um, from this iconic photograph. And ultimately, it was an important stepping stone to really uh, discover the molecular structure of DNA for which uh, Watson, Crick and Wilkins have uh, received the Nobel Prize. You can also see in this photograph that the photograph was uh, by Franklin. So the question is, who is or who was Franklin? And so that started me looking into this uh, in more detail. Turns out it was Rosalind Franklin who was involved in taking this, uh, this iconic famous X-ray photograph. She was born um, in, in 1920 in Notting Hill, London. And very early in her childhood, she showed exceptional scholastic um, abilities. She was uh, described to be alarmingly clever. Um, uh, she spent uh, a lot of time doing uh, arithmetic with pleasure and she invariably got the, the sums always right. So it was very clear that she um, had a passion for science. She went to uh, a girls' school in West London, uh, which she passed a matriculation with uh, distinction and was awarded a university scholarship. So she decided to uh, study chemistry at the Newnham College in Cambridge. And in 1941, she was awarded the second class honor for a final exam. This distinction was accepted as a bachelor degree. Uh, and rather than uh, delving directly into a PhD thesis, she decided to fulfill the National Service Act, uh, working as an assistant research officer at the British Coal uh, Utilization Research Association, where she uh, studied the porosity of coal, it was a big problem um, and of great interest back in the time because uh, people were interested in enhancing uh, the fuel, um, the, the, the effectiveness to burn coal, but also as a filter material for gas masks. Um, she was able to, uh, uh, to use some of the work that she's done. And she uh, finished the PhD thesis in 1945 on the physical chemistry of solid organic colloids with uh, special reference to coal. And she moved on um, and started, can you go next slide? And accepted uh, what we would call now a postdoctoral position in 1947 in Paris in, in Mehring's lab. Um, and there she was supposed, exposed to uh, practical aspects of X-ray diffraction, in particular on amorphous substances. So she learned all of these skills. She became a real expert in this. And um, she used these, uh, these new skills uh, because she recognized that this is going to be a fruitful approach to solve some of the remaining challenges related to coal, carbon, or carbonaceous materials. And the contributions that she made to the field in these uh, few years being a postdoc in this lab uh, were so fundamental that uh, they really had a lasting impact on the physics and chemistry of coal and carbon uh, nowadays uh, fundamental to, uh, to uh, the study and our knowledge of, of coal and carbonic materials. Um, she then uh, accepted a fellowship to work at King's College in London. Um, 
This was mainly coming from her being one of the leading XRD experts. Uh, she was uh, she, she was offered this fellowship to help support the efforts on um, studying DNA fibers um, in, in Wilkins group. And she immediately started to improve the XRD setup. She also got very good at controlling the hydration levels of DNA samples that helped her to distinguish DNA A from DNA B. And she was able to, uh, to take these, uh, these uh, magnificent uh, photographs uh, from DNA strands uh, that she uh, um, prepared. Unfortunately, there was an intense conflict uh, in this research group, uh, which resulted in a terrible working atmosphere. One of the outcomes was that Wilkins was sharing this photograph 51 with Watson and Crick, uh, which then turned out to be uh, one of the crucial contributions that really enabled Watson and Crick to propose the DNA structure as we know it today. Um, Rosalind decided to uh, leave King's College and she moved uh, to Burbeck College in 1953. Um, the department chair was known to promote and support female crystallographer, and it immediately improved uh, her situation. Uh, she was able to start fruitful collaboration with colleagues, in particular um, Aaron Pluk, um, and they went on and became very successful in studying uh, the structure of RNA, tobacco mosaic virus, as well as the polio virus. And they were able to show the first structural virus analysis, and they realized that the RNA is actually encapsulated within the virus. Um, this was so earth shattering back then that she was asked to showcase a five foot tall molecular model of a virus at the first World Fair after World War II, 1958 in Belgium. However, unfortunately, if you go to the next slide, um, Rosalind passed away the day before the opening of the World Fair uh, at the age of 37. Um, uh, this was a big loss uh, for the scientific community. Um, her work at the Burbeck College was continued by Aaron Klug, who um, uh, ultimately was um, uh, awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1982. And he recognized Rosalind's uh, contribution to the field by saying that uh, Rosalind Franklin herself might have stood on this platform had her life not have been uh, tragically cut short. Uh, Rosalind's posthumous recognition are too many to list. I encourage you to, uh, to look them up um, on Wikipedia. Uh, the last one, uh, one, of the, one of the last ones was that the ExoMars rover was uh, named after her. Um, and so um, I hope that, you know, this encourages you to, uh, to look up uh, what Rosalind uh, Franklin has done in her short but very um, successful career as a scientist. Thank you. Thank you, Roman. We have one more highlight uh, by Maria Higgins, who cannot be here in person uh, because of scheduling conflicts with teaching. So I'll be going through her slides. And what she wanted to talk about is a little bit of Hispanic and Latina women in science. And in particular, a highlight of uh, France, uh, France Cordova. So just a quick background of um, Hispanic and Latina women in science. Uh, only a third of the global workforce in science are women. Um, and in particular, in the United States, only 2% of women um, are of Hispanic descent in engineering and science fields. So that's a little bit low uh, worldwide as well as the United States. But actually, when you look at uh, Latin America and Central America, the numbers are, are, are quite a bit different. In Latin America, almost 50% of female researchers, I'm sorry, of researchers are female, as well as in Southeastern Europe, uh, 49%. Um, and overall, uh, that compares uh, is quite high compared to other places, such as, for example, in the European Union. Um, so if we focus now on, on uh, France Cordova, she was raised in a mixed family environment. Uh, her mother was uh, Irish American and her father was Mexican American. She is an astrophysicist and she was the uh, 14th director of the NSF, um, as well as um, the 11th president uh, of Purdue University. So her work was is really on in astronomy and astrophysics, in particular in detecting uh, in radiation detection 
um, from various celestial bodies. She was essentially an expert in uh, multi-wavelength astronomy and wrote uh, or edited the first uh, book on multi-wavelength astronomy. And so she really pushed the field to go beyond just uh, measurements at single wavelength, uh, specific energies, but to include basically a broad spectrum of information when looking at, um, uh, for example, the Crab Nebula, which gives you richness of information if you look at, for example, the radio versus infrared versus visible versus x-rays versus gamma rays, etc. She was a faculty at Penn State. So she's she was at Penn State from 1989 to 1993, um, where she was the head of the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. Physics. Um, she uh, has given various interviews where she's described some of her interests and in what got her into science. And um, she, she credits her curiosity um, with basically looking at the stars and simply just wondering how are they formed? Why are some, why are some of them very bright while others are very visible? But growing up, um, she basically says that she didn't really have a role, role model in STEM. It just didn't seem like someone like her would really do science or engineering. So instead she studied English literature and that's what her uh, believe her BS degree is in. So she was not a scientist, but she was watching TV and she saw this documentary about neutron stars and it really fascinated her. And it's interesting because then a lot of her initial career would center around some of the scientists that were featured in this um, show about neutron stars. Um, she, she connected with some of the, one of the folks that was from the movie at, um, at MIT um, was offered a position, but she actually chose to then uh, to go to Caltech instead, working with somebody who also had been um, either featured or highlighted uh, in this show. So Franz has a really nice quote underrepresented groups are not in the sciences because they weren't exposed to it. They need an avenue for exposure is exposure from books and televisions and events that get children on a research campus. Inspiration goes a long way. So I think France Cordova, in addition to her um, significant technical advances has also demonstrated a pathway for people from various backgrounds, um, genders and ethnicities uh, to demonstrate that folks like her can also be a world-renowned scientist. So with that, I'd like to close this webinar. I'm very grateful to all of the panelists for their time, as well as the attendees uh, for listening to what we had to say today. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day and um, thank you all. <laughs>